Live here. We are going to continue talking about uh, the Holy Spirit today. Uh, again, this was a, a, a lesson idea, lesson suggestion request that, that came to me a few weeks ago, and uh, I wanted to break this up into a couple of different parts. There may be a part three. I haven't decided if there's going to be a part three to this yet or not. I'll decide that probably later today or tomorrow. Uh, so if we have part three, that'll be next week. Um, but last week, we talked about the actions of the Holy Spirit, the fact that the Holy Spirit has been around. Uh, even though in the Old Testament, um, it was commonly referred to just as the Spirit of God, uh, we do see that that Spirit has been active since the beginning. Uh, we see the Word of God coming to the prophets. We see uh, the, the attitude and the mindset of God coming to, uh, coming to some of those uh, great heroes. Um, I particularly think of, of some from the book of Judges. We read about the Spirit of the Lord coming upon this, uh, this judge or that judge. Um, we, we read about this inspired word. We read about this attitude, this mindset uh, that comes to people. Uh, a lot of times referred to as the Spirit of God. We also see the Spirit leaving some people, uh, particularly I, I'm mindful of Saul, uh, King Saul, when he, um, when he began to disobey God and began to try to take actions on his own, we, we read about the Spirit departing from him, his, his blessing, his, his approval, uh, the, the mindset that he had departing from him. And so we, we had a pretty good lesson last, uh, last time, I believe, on kind of establishing a foundation of the fact that there was and is a Spirit and that there are some activities that have occurred throughout both covenants uh, and that's important for us to understand and to know the history uh, of the Spirit, the activity of the Spirit, so we can kind of anchor ourselves when it comes time to a, for a discussion on the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to be talking about the gift of miracles. Now, I want to jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 27 through 31 as we really get started here because this chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I could have based this entire lesson out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm here to tell you. Go back, read chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians when you get a chance. You will have a greater understanding of the miraculous and of the misuse of the miraculous and some of the other things that we're going to be talking about Today, So, starting in verse 27, we read Paul writing to this congregation at Corinth. He says, Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And then he finishes the chapter before he goes into chapter 13. And I will show you a still more excellent way. So why did I want to start there? Well, because when we start there, we see that the Holy Spirit was not, the, uh, the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit um, was not the only gift. It was not the only blessing that was out there. We see that there is a variety of, that is given. We see that there are all sorts of things that God has empowered that first century church with in order to get the job done, in order to reach people with the gospel, in order to, to see them baptized into Christ, in order to see them established as faithful Christians, in order to, to securely pass along the word. But there were other things besides those miracles that helped make those happen. Uh, Paul asks the question, are all apostles? No. Well, there were only 13, 14, if you, if you count Judas. Uh, are all prophets? No. Not everybody uh, preaches the word like that. Not everybody predicts the future. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Uh, do all possess the gifts of healing? No. Tongues? No. Interpret? No. So what do we have? What do we have when we're talking about miracles? We have something that is limited. So let's go ahead and take a look at the works of the Holy Spirit. We're going to come back to the things that I've just mentioned a few minutes ago, but I want to see what the, what the Holy Spirit, the miraculous works of the Holy Spirit, were actually involved with, if you will, and what they're actually doing in the New Testament. So the first thing that we really see of the, of the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit in the church, not talking about the miracles of Christ, but in the church, the first thing that we see in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 12, is the speaking in tongues. Now, 
Do not be confused. The speaking in tongues here is the speaking of an, actual, an actually audible human language. If you go through and you read this passage, you will see all the people from various countries who had come to Jerusalem. They had come for the day of Pentecost. There were perhaps some other people who were in Jerusalem as well. And when the apostles started speaking, the people started to hear their native languages being spoken. Now, with that many languages being spoken and that few apostles there, it kind of makes you wonder where the miracle actually was. Was it with the speaker or was it something that was happening with the listener? We don't know. But we do know that it was a genuine human language that was being spoken and being heard in this particular case. There are people uh, and, and religious organizations that will say it's a heavenly tongue. Uh, that's a tongue that mankind can't understand. That is not the case. That has never been the case in the New Testament. They were speaking in foreign languages. In Acts chapter 3, we see the lame man that's laid by the gate beautiful uh, in verses 1 through 9 where we see the Spirit helping give the apostles the power to heal the sick. We also see in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, the Holy Spirit was used to punish the rebellious. Uh, the case of Ananias and Sapphira, again, I mentioned this not too long ago, the, the most bone-chilling uh, verse in the Bible is when Peter tells Sapphira that the, men, the feet of the men who bury her husband are outside the door waiting to come and take her and bury her as well. Uh, and so we see after that happened, not because just that they kept the money back, but because Peter even tells them, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And so we see this punishment coming upon them, and we see all striking the entire church after this. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through 60, we see the inspired preaching of the Word. That would be the sermon of Stephen. Stephen goes basically through the entire history of Israel. He goes from the start all the way to where they're at today, and he really lays it to the Pharisees. Uh, and they decide that they need to kill him because of this. So they stone Stephen, and then at the end of this chapter where Stephen is, is dying, we see uh, it's finally revealed to us that he was full of the Holy Spirit, that he was fully embodying the Holy Spirit, and he was able to see heaven as he was dying that day. And so we see the entire lesson uh, we see the entire speech, probably in Acts chapter 2 as well as in various other locations, where the Holy Spirit inspired the speaker to speak specific words. That could probably be said of any of the speeches uh, by the apostles uh, within the book of Acts, but the one for uh, Stephen's particularly stands out here. We also see the showing of God's acceptance with the, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. So we have Peter in Acts chapter 10 who has a vision. The sheets lower down from heaven. There are unclean animals in it. And he's told to arise and eat. And he says, I, I don't touch anything that's unclean, right? And, and the vision tells him, I'm giving you the short version of the story here. The vision tells him, don't call unclean what I have called clean. And immediately after that, he's called into the household of a Gentile. Now, Normally, a Gentile would have been considered unclean, but Peter, having had this vision, maybe he's starting to think about things, but he gets there and he's preaching the gospel to Cornelius, and the Holy Spirit falls upon the household of Cornelius, falls upon Gentiles, which hadn't happened at this point. It hadn't happened up to this point because the message had not gone to the Gentiles. And so Peter, seeing the Holy Spirit fall upon the Gentiles, uh, you know, seeing that God did not withhold his spirit, asks, why should I withhold baptism? And so uh, the household of Cornelius is baptized, and the Gentiles are welcomed into the church because God used his spirit to show their acceptance. We also see in other places where the Holy Spirit's power is used to raise the dead. We read about Paul. People worry about preachers going 40 minutes today. <laughs> 35 minutes, man, you need to stop. Uh, we, need, we need to channel Moses. Let my people go. Uh, you know, we're, we're ready to roll out at 35 minutes. Well, Paul preached until midnight, and poor old Eutychus was, was trying to stay awake, and he, and he fell out of the window and landed on the ground, and, and the fall killed him, and, and everybody was upset, and so Paul, of course, was able to use the power of the Holy Spirit, or the power of the Holy Spirit was able to be channeled through Paul, if you will, and he was, a, a, he was able to raise Eutychus from the dead. And so we see this happening 
We see several other places where uh, the sick are healed, where, where the dead are raised, where uh, inspired lessons are, are being preached. We see a lot of different things going on throughout the book of Acts with the miraculous work, uh, the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit. So we see a lot going on there, but what's the purpose? What was the purpose behind the coming of the Holy Spirit? And what was the purpose of the giving of the miraculous gifts? Because they weren't just given for us to, to utilize as we see fit. They weren't given to us uh, to entertain us, to show us parlor tricks, or to exercise power or dominion over someone or something else. These things uh, came about, these miraculous gifts came about because God had a specific purpose for each and every one of them. The first purpose that we really see here is to instruct the church. Remember what Jesus told the apostles at his ascension. He said, go back into Jerusalem and wait. And then when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, uh, you, know, you, you know that power is going to come. You, you, you'll be ready for it. And then we see when that power came, the first thing was that they started proclaiming the gospel. They began the establishment of the church that day. So this was the instructions of the church. But if we back up even to John chapter 16, verse 13, we referred to that in Bible class this morning, right? That the Holy Spirit was going to be sent to guide them into truth. And of course, we ask the question, how much truth? All truth. And so the Spirit was promised by Jesus. Jesus only had three years with these guys. He only had three years with them. And so uh, you can learn a lot in three years, but you can't learn everything. And so they needed more instruction. They needed more guidance. And so the Spirit came to guide them into all truth. We also see from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 uh, that the Holy Spirit inspired the written word as well. Uh, Paul, Paul tells Timothy that all scripture is God-breathed, is given by God. Uh, and that idea of being God-breathed is the idea of, of the Spirit coming, and, and coming upon the people uh, to write that word. So we see that the inspiration of the word uh, also fits in with the instruction to the church. So those letters came individually uh, back in the first century, but now we have them collectively today. So even today, 2,000 years later, uh, almost 2,000 years later, we're still being instructed by the works of the Holy Spirit in the first century. We also see that the Spirit came to inspire faith in the believers. Uh, Christianity was not easy. Christianity was something that came with a lot of challenges. There were a lot of people who were persecuting them. There were a lot of people who, who wanted to, to put them down and to exterminate them. We see the Jews persecuting them well into the 60s uh, A.D. And then we see uh, after the destruction of the Jerusalem, uh, the persecution really started coming from the Romans about that point. And so we see the, the, the Christians being persecuted all throughout this. And, and that's tough. But if you have something like this miraculous measure happening, it's going to inspire faith in you. Uh, we see in Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, we see the healings of the apostles brought people to the apostles. They saw what they were doing, and, and that inspired faith in them. That inspired them to come and to hear this word proclaimed. Sure, some people were bringing folks just to be healed and then probably went on their way. But we see in Acts chapter 5, there were so many Christians that Luke quits counting. More than ever, we see in this, in this passage. And so the Spirit was inspiring faith. And we also see, kind of what we were referring to just a couple of minutes ago, in Acts chapter 10, we see uh, Peter having faith in God's work with the Gentiles. We might not make that connection a lot, but think about what the Spirit had to do. Think about what the vision had to teach him. Think about what uh, the Holy Spirit falling upon these, uh, these Gentiles in, the, in this Gentile home meant to Peter. And there are a bunch of other examples throughout the Bible uh, of these miracles being performed, uh, inspiring faith in the believers. We see it all the way from Acts chapter 1 all the way through the end of the book and on after that. So we see lots of work of the Spirit inspiring faith. We also see the idea of the confirmation of authenticity. Authenticity, authority, and inspiration all go together. 
uh, as we've been talking about on Sunday mornings. This kind of fits in with, uh, with the Bible, lesson, uh, Bible class lesson today. So this is a confirmation of authenticity. We see uh, the, the apostles, again, going back to Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 12, we see the apostles speaking in foreign tongues. And some of the people got up and they thought to themselves, uh, what are these guys babbling about? They must be drunk. And of course, <laughs> I love Peter's defense. We're not drunk, it's too early. <laughs> you kind of take that a couple different ways, maybe. But what he's saying is, this is not what people normally do. We're not drunk. This is, this is a manifestation of something else. This is the manifestation of that spirit that was promised in Joel chapter 2. And some of the people that were there, some of the people that were there said, no, 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 you guys are wrong. They're not drunk. They're not babbling gibberish. I'm hearing a language from home. There's something going on here. Sure, there were a lot of people that walked away. It's estimated there were probably a million people in Jerusalem for Pentecost. 3,000 were converted that day. Statistically, that's not a lot of people, but imagine 12 men standing up and preaching and converting 3,000 because of these foreign tongues that they're proclaiming the message in. We also see in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, a healing and casting out of demons. We see that people came and they listened to Philip and then they listened to, to uh, the apostles, to Peter and John when they got there. They listened to them because they saw this exercise of authority. Again, authority and authenticity are very similar in scope and in nature. And so when they see these people doing these miracles, they understand that there is some power behind them. Just like Nicodemus uh, talking to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God because no man could do these things lest God be with him. And so we see this authenticity really showing. We also see something that sometimes we overlook. The Holy Spirit sometimes intervened in the plans of men. There were plenty of times where the apostles had an idea in what they were going to do and where they were going to go. Even one guy who before he was an apostle decided he was going to go to Damascus and he was going to arrest some Christians and he was going to bring them back to Jerusalem bound if necessary to stand trial for preaching this Jesus. But the Holy Spirit intervened, didn't he? The Holy Spirit met Paul on that road, knocked him to his knees, blinded him, and sent him into Damascus. And then the Holy Spirit turned around and, and he sent a guy, Ananias, he sent him into Paul. And he said, convert this guy. And what did Ananias say? This guy's a murderer. I know who he is. And God told him through the Spirit, he said, I've got plans for this guy. So he intervened in the plans of men. We also see later on in Paul's work, he intended to go further into Asia Minor, but then he had a vision of a man from Macedonia crying out, come help us. We see the Spirit intervening in these plans of men in this day and time. So the Spirit wasn't just there to, to heal a few sick and to, uh, and, to, and to gain some attention. There were lots of other things. This is just a sample list. There are lots of other things that happened throughout the New Testament, that happened throughout the book of Acts, that we read about that the Spirit was involved in. And so there was a lot more to it than just a few parlor tricks, as some people would say. And, and it's not there just to try to show off. It's not there to just to try to impress other people or to gain a hierarchy. That was one of the problems that Paul had to deal with in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 all the way through 14. And again, as we said, this wasn't the only gift that had been given to the first century church. It was an important one, don't get me wrong. It helped do all of these things. So we see that there's much more to it than just this, even though this was a key component. Because the miraculous was limited. The miraculous was only meant to do so much. And it was only meant to go so far. And it was only meant to be around for so long. And despite the claims of some people today, those miraculous gifts had a limit. There are people around who would say, oh no, the, the miraculous measure is still there, and I don't see any proof of that. Does that mean that the Holy Spirit is gone? Well, of course not. 
That means there was a limit to the role it played in the first century, and they hit that limit. Think about this. The miraculous gifts, again, were not the only blessings from God. There was a lot of other things that were going on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, uh, before that passage we read earlier uh, in the lessons, we see that God gave these gifts as He saw fit. As He saw fit. You might be, if you had the miraculous measure, you might be able to do one thing, and somebody else might be able to do another, and a third person might have had hands laid on him by the apostle, and he might not be able to do anything miraculous at all. And that's okay. God distributed them as he saw fit. And some people say, well, I should have gotten a miraculous measure. Well, take it up with God. Let's see what he has to say about it. God gave them as he saw fit. And again, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16, looks a lot like 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, the, the, there were other gifts that were not miraculous. Administrative work. Administrating. Who would have ever thought that an administrative job would be a gift from God? If you've ever tried to administer anything, you know it can sometimes take divine intervention to get it done. But we see that there were a lot of other things. Teaching, benevolence, uh, administrative work. Feeding those who need to be fed. We see from the book of Acts 2 with the, with the protodeacons, the seven men that were chosen to take care of the widows. We see a lot of other things that were needful that were put in place early in the establishment of the church that were not based on miraculous gifts. Plus, there was also a gift that was greater. We'll get to that in a minute. We also see that the miraculous gifts were temporary. They were temporary. Well, preacher, how do you know that they were temporary? Well, the Bible tells us that they were temporary. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 18, we see Simon the sorcerer, after his conversion, he wanted to, to be able to pass along the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and Philip was there, and he was performing these miracles. And, and he saw that Philip was performing, but nobody else could. And when the apostles got there, the apostles were able to pass it along. And he wanted to purchase not the gift of the Holy Spirit, not the miraculous measure, but the ability to give it to other people. And he was willing to buy it. Now, of course, he was condemned for that, but Simon did recognize one thing. The only people who could pass along the miraculous measure were the apostles. Guess what? They passed from this life into the next by the end of the first century. They were gone by the end of the first century. John, maybe he lived five, six more years if church history stands true. So by 101, 102 A.D., the last apostle passed from this life into the next. And there is no indication that late in his life, John was still passing along the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit. There's no indication of it. And so we know with the death of the apostles, there was also a passing of the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit from active, uh, actively working to not. Those who claim today to be apostles, with a capital A apostle, those who claim today to have a miraculous power of the Holy Spirit are, mis are mistaken or misunderstanding the text. And there are a few out there that are outright dishonest making that claim. I don't want to impugn anybody's, motive, anybody mo anybody's motives, but there are some who would take advantage. We also see... From 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 12, that the miraculous is only a partial blessing. I know in part, prophesy in part. Only part. That's partial. That's not full. God's not going to leave us with a partial blessing. He is going to give us a full blessing. And so that means the miraculous is not the full blessing we get from God. It's only a part of the blessing. And so we see Paul is telling them the partial will pass away. The partial is going to pass away. With them, it leaves, it goes. We also see here that the miraculous gifts were replaced. This is important to us. This is the, where the lesson leads today. The fact that there was something else 
that was going to come because even in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, or 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, we read about the people misusing the miraculous gifts. And that's not going to stand. They're not going to stand. They are going to be taken out of the way. This thing that people had that was a blessing from God, as partial as it was, they were taking it and they were using it for their own selfish ambition. And Paul tells us, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. He tells that even to the Philippians. What's going on with the Corinthians here? There is not a full-time eternal need for these. Imagine how people would be using the miraculous gifts today if we still had them. Man, there's no telling what kind of mess people would be making of it. In chapter 12 and verse 31, Paul said there was a better way. I will show you a more excellent way. See, the Corinthians had some problems, but there were solutions to the problem. They had to get their mindset off of these miraculous gifts and put their mind on what was important. And if you go to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 7, you will see that love does more than the miraculous gifts ever could. Love does more than the miraculous gifts ever could. I love to read 1 Corinthians 13 at a wedding. It tells you how important love is as a foundation for anything that we do. And it's really, it's really a wonderful thing to, to talk about establishing that as a foundation for your family, as a foundation for a life together. That is a beautiful thing. But Paul here wasn't just addressing these types of relationships with this. He was addressing their immaturity and the fact that these people were not established in the love of God and the love for one another that they needed to be established in. In fact, they were misusing what God had given them uh, and overlooking the most important thing. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, remember what he said? Twofold. He said, love God with everything you've got. Just put it like that. All your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, Mark adds. And then the second one is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. They were missing that. They were missing that. And Paul wanted them to know that the greatest gift that we can have is love. When I was a child, he said, I spoke like a child and I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish things. What does that mean? Love takes maturity. Serving one another takes maturity. Following after God takes maturity. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were for a church that was in its infancy. And that was a more excellent way for things to be done. And that was to live a life in love. Love for your Savior. Love for God the Father. Love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love for the lost. Enough love to do what other people need over what I need. Enough love to drive me out into the highways and the hedgerows to find those who would come to the feast. Love enough for me to forgive when people offend me. Love enough for me to ask for forgiveness when I offend them. Love enough for me to put aside whatever might divide us and to come together on what we have in common. Love enough to share the gospel with a lost world. That is the true legacy of the Holy Spirit. Guiding us from not knowing who God is to living a life filled with the love of God. That starts with us becoming obedient to the gospel message of Christ. Because He loved us enough to leave heaven, to come to this earth, to take on the form of a man, to spend time training those who had come after him and to go to the cross to shed his blood so that our sins might be washed away.
He who, know no, who knew no sin became sin in our stead. If you're here today and you are not yet a child of God, if you have not yet been baptized to have your sins washed away, and you need to do so today, we stand ready to help you in any way that we can. If you are a child of God, but you find that you have not been serving Him as you should, and you need to repent of that sin, know that God will forgive you again if you confess that sin and repent as well. And He will establish you back in His kingdom where He wanted you from the very beginning. So if you're here today and you have either spiritual need, why don't you come, meet me up front, and let that need be made known as together we stand and sing our invitation song.